Good evening. Goodbye forever by Nat Chang Rinpoche. Many apologies, first of all, for the abrupt ending last night. Uh, broadband was interrupted. So uh, we're going to start this evening just before where we were uh, rudely interrupted yesterday. So um, you won't have missed anything. This is chapter seven, part two. We soon learnt that one did not sit as a blues player unless one was a pianist. One also had to practice as if one were on stage. Ron delivered all this as ultimate fact. Steve and I accepted Ron's word as wisdom from on high. What else would one do when faced with a prodigy, a virtuoso, a genius? We never sat whilst playing again. It was immediately clear to Steve that Ron was his musical superior. Ron had taken O-level music when he was 12 and A-level music when he was 13. He'd also taken musical grades outside school and could have got a university place easily, but for his age. His understanding of music theory was terrifying, according to Steve. Ron could see Steve's efforts were well in advance of anyone else he'd met, but was evidently unsure if I was worth the effort. Knowing I was a vocalist, Ron asked me to sing. So I obliged, unaccompanied with In My Time of Dying. Steve grinned the following day. Ron said he never heard a voice like yours that wasn't from Chicago. I was surprised. I know I can sing, but I can't play anything other than harp. And that's still a bit basic. Well, Ron's ambition's an electric Chicago blues band, Steve replied. He said that it doesn't matter how good he is on guitar or I am on bass, we have to have a vocalist who can sing Hoochie Coochie Man and mean it. He said, Steve laughed, some wimpy white wanker from the home counties who sounded like a choir boy just wouldn't cut it. I was emotionally perplexed. I know I'm not a choir boy and I do make a fair stab with black southern states accent, but there are other people who sing much better. There may be, but Ron's not met them yet. And those he's heard are all at least 10 years older than you. Yes, I suppose we couldn't exactly get Jack Bruce, could we? No, but Ron's not as keen on Jack Bruce as you are. He says that he's more of a jazz vocalist and that he prefers your voice. Right, well, that's novel, but I suppose I should be delighted. I can't see it myself. I think Jack Bruce is the state of the art. And so we met up every week, sometimes several times a week, and practised. We were a band. Ron had made that happen almost overnight. I was immensely grateful because the dream was no longer a dream. It was reality and a vast, shining reality. I was also grateful for Mr Priest, the English teacher, even though he was strict, sarcastic and slightly severe. He was an old-fashioned teacher, even though he was a relatively young man. He was a good man, however, with a strong sense of diligence and integrity. He was intelligent, philosophical, intellectual, and his sarcasm didn't worry me. I saw the wit of his remarks 
and in some way enjoyed them, even when applied to me. I wanted his approval, and, unlike the approval of my father, there was a direct way to obtain it. Hard, unremitting work. Mr Priest's class seating arrangement was based on end of term marks. I started more or less at the bottom of the class and rose to the top table alongside Ling Lindsay Golding. Mr Priest warmed to me considerably as I rose and it obviously pleased him to see me rising. He took to smiling at me as I sat down and to greeting me if I met him walking to school. One day I plucked up the courage to show him my poetry and, although he wasn't impressed, he took the time to show me the failings of what I'd written. He didn't believe in giving praise as encouragement, but he was more than willing to help me. Free verse is all very well, he said, but if you wish to break rules, you will have to be able to write fluently within the rules you wish to break. Any fool can throw jumbled words onto paper and call them poetry. He showed me the works of great poets and expected me to write essays on them. I wrote poetry essays in the mathematics class and threw down a smattering of numbers to make it look as if I'd been working at the assigned tasks. It didn't take long before the mathematics teacher gave up on me as a lost cause. Simerson is numerically retarded and there is no purpose in him being in this class, he told the headmaster. And thus I was allowed to use the time for additional English. It was deemed that it would be a waste of school money to allow me to sit O-level mathematics. I used to time my walk to school deliberately to coincide with Mr Priest. He was a tall, thin man and keeping up with him was not easy. Everything about him seemed designed to make me work hard, but I was amply rewarded by his attention. He wasn't keen on the beat poets, but he gave his subjective opinions no excessive objective weight. I was to learn the rules and structure of poetry and master the English language. Only then could I experiment. I began reading the Penguin Classics series. It was a revelation, a new horizon peopled with intriguing personalities and their artistic philosophies. I read Nikolai Vasilievich Gogol, Honoré de Balzac, Gustave Flaubert, François-Marie Arouet, whose nom de plume was Voltaire, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, Jean Genet, Franz Kafka, and generally anyone with an interesting non-English name. 1966 was the year in which a strange and disturbing event occurred in the summer. A young man called James Kirkpatrick, who'd previously attended Nether Netherfield School, was wanted by the police. We discovered this on the news the day after a local drama occurred. I was sitting in the living room one evening watching Patrick McGowan's television series, The Prisoner. The surrealism of the series appealed to me, but not to my father. The surrealism was heightened on this particular evening when I heard a car crash at the bottom of our road. There's just been a car crash at the bottom of our road, Dad. My father, somewhat taken aback by my apparent nonchalance, leapt up from his chair. 
I made for the door to see whether I was accurate in my assessment of the sound I'd heard. And my father followed me out into the street to join me, where we stood vaguely bewildered as a young man legged it past us at a speed that seemed almost superhuman. After him, my father cried out, and I ran off up the road, wondering exactly what I was supposed to do if I caught up with him. The chances of success were utterly remote, as I've never been a runner. The police soon passed me and asked me what I was doing. My father told me to chase him. The policeman shook his head as if he'd never heard anything so absurd and replied, Go home, lad. Good try, but we shall take care of this. Then he ran to catch the other police who were attempting to gain on James Kirkpatrick. The next day, the incident was reported on the news and it appeared that James Kirkpatrick was wanted for armed robbery. The police had not caught him that night and he was said to be lying low somewhere, maybe in the woods or somewhere further afield. My father admitted that he should not have sent me after the fellow, but he'd thought, from my nonchalance in reporting the car crash, that I'd be up for such an ex exploit. He was genuinely horrified when he discovered that James Kirkpatrick was wanted for armed robbery and that he may have been armed at the time I went chasing up the road after him. I told my father I'd been happy to chase him, armed or not, and if the police hadn't turned me back, I'd have continued. This was all entirely bravado, of course. But my father then surprised me by beaming at me as if I was the apple of his eye. Wonders would never cease. Later that day, I was sitting with my guitar in the garden, up under the apple tree at the top end near the lane, reading a book of World War I war poetry, which I was studying at school. I was trying to memorise Rupert Brooke's poem, The Soldier, my father thought it right and proper that I was studying such work, even though he would not have approved of the satirical anti-war sentiments of some of the war poets. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth, a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam. Graham, my brother, suddenly hailed me. Vic, Mum wants you in the house. I went to see what was wanted and my mother asked me where I wanted the legs of my Levi's hemmed. They hadn't had a pair in my leg length, and so they needed to be shortened. I've always had slightly short legs in relation to my waist size, so this happened from time to time. After trying the Levi's on and having the legs tucked up to the right length, I returned to my war poets, and where was the guitar? I stared stupidly for a moment or two and then scanned the area quickly. The guitar was gone. My father was in his workshop and I wondered if he'd taken it in there. He hadn't. Graham hadn't taken it either. Just as I was asking Graham about it, however, my father came storming into the house in full rage, but this time not with me. It will have been that criminal the police are hunting. They said that he could still be hiding in the woods. He'll be the one to have stolen the guitar. And with that, he marched down the road to the public call box and telephoned the police. I lived in hope of two things after that. One was that the guitar would be found. The other greater hope was that my father would buy me a replacement. 
The guitar never came to light, even though James Kirkpatrick was captured and imprisoned. My father never mentioned the loss of my guitar again. It wasn't that it had been such a wonderful instrument, but it was unique. After all the work that had gone into it, I found that I missed it more than I would have imagined. And still four years before I'd be 18 and receive, receiving the much dreamed of Gibson EBO. 1966 was the autumn when I met Annelie Mandelbaum, a 22 year old Swiss au pair at the Euphoria discotheque. There was something about her that gave me a subcutaneous flashback to the white lady who had appeared in my room or my dreams or whichever it was when I was a child. She seemed to glow in some preternatural manner for which words were useless. I'd noticed that about ladies in general, but some glowed more than others. It had nothing to do with beauty, so it was not the effect of attraction. The elderly Mrs Love had glowed too. It had nothing to do with friendship either, because Steve didn't glow. I had never seen that glow emanating from men. I cast my mind back and it seemed to me that the presence of girls or women was always magical in some way that I could not define. It was almost as if having seen the white lady had done something to my brain. Maybe now I just saw in a different way, the way that insects see ultraviolet and beyond. I'd read in one of Steve's nature journals that trichromatic insects, such as bees, have three types of pigment receptors, like humans. They distinguish a wider spectrum of colours than other insects, but their pigment receptors don't coincide with those of human beings. The spectrum of colours visible to insects is a little higher in frequency than humans see. The lowest frequency we see is red, which is invisible to insects. Conversely, white, vi while violet is the highest frequency humans detect, many insects see ultraviolet and even higher frequencies. Maybe something like that had happened to me and now ladies simply sparkled and glowed. I was not so wrapped in conjecture as to fail to notice one young lady intermittently glancing in my direction as I danced. There was something unusual about her, other than how incandescently beautiful she was. There was something in her expression that reminded me of Alice. It was as if Alice had somehow grown up to be a few years older than me. It was also as if Tara had manifested from the pages of the book on Tibet I'd seen at primary school. Because there was something about her that wasn't exactly English. Was it her clothes? Was it her way of sitting or her projected personality? I started to feel as if I was performing for her. I also took care not to look obvious as I inched by what I hoped would be imperceptible increments in her direction. Suddenly, she was grinning broadly and clapping. No one ever clapped at the Euphoria discotheque, and so we became the entire centre of attention. Feeling gauche, I bowed and offered her my hand. I must have seen that in a movie. She seemed to find my gesture charming and joined me on the floor. We danced for an hour before she said, 
I am a little tired now, and it has become the time I must leave. My disappointment was transparent, because she offered, if you would like to come home with me? Of all things, I replied, I'd like nothing better. Somehow she had the impression that I was 16 or so, and to my shame, I did nothing to disabuse her of that error. Then, when I found out she was 22, I decided that honesty was definitely not the best policy. What were a few years here or there? From that day, I moved from early adolescence into the glorious vistas of adulthood and never looked back. Meeting Annalie, signalled the return of Tara. From that point I started having dreams again. The vividness returned and with it a sexual dimension that had not previously existed. The sexuality was not connected with Tara but with two girls who may have been her daughters. At first I thought I was dreaming of Annalie but she was pale blonde, almost white, and the girls were so dark-haired that their tresses could have been black.